Welcome to 2024 and the newly renamed MarsCast, a podcast from Mid-America Reformed Seminary. On this show, we aim to continue engaging you, our listeners, with faculty, alumni, and guests as they examine theology and culture through a Reformed lens. I'm your host, Jared Luchibor, Director of Marketing at Mars. Thank you for tuning in. You may be wondering about the new name. The Seminary Podcast enters 2024 with a fresh name indicative of our reformatting of the show. We used to do a generic roundtable configuration of older episodes, but have slowly been transitioning into episodes singularly highlighting one of our learned faculty members as they elaborate on doctrine, biblical theology, and cultural dynamics particular to their field of study. As we proceed through the year of our Lord 2024, our hope is that we provide refreshing content produced by our faculty and friends, and that this will be of great service to you, your family, and your church. In this inaugural episode of 2024, Dr. Mark Beach enters part two of a series he started on John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. In this episode, he briefly summarizes Calvin's main purpose and approach in the opening chapters of the Institutes to show that all people have a knowledge of God through creation and conscience and therefore are without excuse. But this knowledge is corrupted and insufficient for salvation. Here's Dr. Beach. Well, in this episode, we continue our journey of learning the Christian faith with John Calvin and through his, specifically, his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Now we actually dive into this famed book of his, and just for some orientation, uh, wisdom and knowledge are concepts that Calvin will take up in this first chapter of book one of his institutes, and his concern is that to know God, we need uh, what will come down to as wisdom, not only about knowledge about God, but about ourselves. And in fact, uh, he'll spend some time, five chapters, really exploring uh, knowledge of God, how we come to know God, and what we do with the knowledge God gives us. He starts out uh, talking in his institutes, he he starts out about a fundamental problem we have as human beings. Uh, How can we know God? And Calvin observes, well, that's a question that really has two sides to it, because to know God, you have to know yourself, and then vice versa, to know yourself you have to know God. So in other words, anyone who doesn't know God really doesn't know himself or herself. These are people that don't know themselves in not knowing God. And in knowing God, now we're on our way to actually uh, understand who and what we are and what's wrong with us and why we should seek remedy from the one who knows us altogether. So he, he, he writes... It's rather well known, near the, the opening lines, nearly all the wisdom we possess, that's to say true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. And they're joined by many bonds, but Calvin says to try to untangle which comes first, which comes next. He finally argues that whether you start with yourself, if it's a true knowledge of self, it's going to lead to knowledge of God. And there's reasons that within ourselves, uh, there's reasons to know God. And by the same token, if you start with God, we're drawn down to ourselves to contemplate ourselves in light of God, which then again brings this wisdom that he's after. Uh, However, he's also very well aware that most people Uh, suppress the knowledge of God. They don't know God. They don't know themselves. They don't know what's wrong with themselves or the like. And uh, yet, feeling our own ignorance or vanity or poverty or infirmity or even our depravity or corruption, we ought to seek wisdom from God. We're so broken 
it's so there's such wreckage and ruin in the human condition. We ought to look, and we have a sense that there is such thing as wisdom and sound virtue and abundance and goodness, and we ought to seek these from God and realize that all such things rest in God alone. So from there, Calvin uh, takes us to some basic important questions. When we contemplate God in his, perf- in his perfection, what do we discover about, our, about ourselves? That we're imperfect, that uh, we're ruined, that uh, we need help. But because of our innate pride, we flatter ourselves, we congratulate ourselves, confined to our own arena of our human thinking with its own corruption. We uh, are very self-congratulatory. And we ignore the straight edge to which we must be shaped, which is God's truth, God's wisdom. But if we lift our thoughts to God as he's revealed himself, and we'll talk about that, how he does that, Uh, We discover what masqueraded as righteousness in us is in fact filthy and and ugly, and what wonderfully impressed us about ourselves, our own wisdom, Calvin says, in light of God, all such begins to stink in its foolishness. So he's he's very emphatic here. Uh, No one knows God if they can't contemplate themselves as God reveals it. And in not knowing yourself, you'll never have a knowledge of God. He appeals to the book of Job, for example, when, when God reveals himself to Job at the end of the book, you know, Job repents in dust and ashes. Um, he finally contemplates himself the way, uh, the, the way of uh, the, that fits, that, that, that he comes to self-discovery of where he doesn't measure up and who God truly is and thus who he is. So a knowledge of God and ourselves must be mutually connected and uh, not only must, it simply is mutually connected. But the order of right teaching, and that's a big thing for Calvin, the order of right teaching, what's the best way to take up topics and explain them one after another, requires that we start with God. So what is this knowledge of God? What is it to know God? Well, Calvin says the knowledge of God is that by which we not only conceive that there is a God, but also grasp what befits us and is proper to his glory. So right away you see knowledge of God isn't just the thatness of God. There's an oughtness within that. It, it, there's something that calls us to look to him for help, to look to him for blessing, to look to him for what befits us, and to glorify him also, worship him accordingly. Uh, God's providential care, God's uh, forbearing mercy, God's work as creator, fashioner of the universe, all of these things come with a knowledge of God, and it elicits religion or devotion to him. It elicits from us piety, devoutness toward him. Since piety is a big word for Calvin, uh, He defines it for us, and this is helpful for any Christian. Uh, Piety is that reverence joined with love of God. There's both. Reverence for God. He's not just chummy. You don't dumb God down. No, there's reverence for God joined with love of God, which the knowledge of his benefits includes. For until, he writes this, until uh, men recognize that they owe everything to God, that they're nourished by his fatherly care, that he's the author of their every good, that they should seek nothing beyond him. Until that, they'll never yield him willing service. You're not going to uh, yield service to a God who's a tyrant, says Calvin, but one who gives you his fatherly care. Knowing God, who is he? A bully? A meanie? No, he's this God of fatherly care, the author of every good. 
and now surrendered service to that one. That's, that's knowledge. That's piety. That's knowledge of God. Now, what's the religious purpose of this knowledge? Well, Calvin's not very interested in what God is and those sort of deep questions that some theological books get into. He's rather interested in our relationship with God and a true and pure expression of religion uh, toward God. So he says a true religion, a, the true Christian faith, is faith so joined with an earnest fear of God that this fear also embraces willing reverence and carries with it such legitimate worship as is prescribed in the law. And we ought to note this fact, even more diligently, all men have a vague, general veneration for God, but very few really reverence him, worship him. Even if they have a form of religion, it's often uh, through all sorts of ostentation of ceremony, but the sincerity of heart is rare indeed. So where's, where does Calvin get this claim that Everyone has some sort of general knowledge and veneration of God. Well, Calvin, from Scripture, believes that the Scripture teaches what he terms a sense of divinity or a, uh, a sense of the de deity, an implanted sense within our own heart and mind, an awareness of God, um, a seed of religion, he also calls it in another place. Well, what about that? He maintains that all humans perceive that God exists and that he's their maker and that this is built into our makeup as image bearers of God so that all tribes, all peoples have this deep-seated conviction that there is a God. That doesn't mean uh, that this sense of uh, deity uh, manifests itself properly, in fact, just the opposite, it manifests is idolatry, and that's why idolatry flourishes everywhere. That's why there's all these different sorts of religions and faith. That's why there's even a kind of ill religion which uh, resists and seeks to suppress this sense of divinity in us. Uh, atheism manifests itself in all kinds of instinctive uh, idolatry of, well, look even today at the superhero worship, uh, how we're, inf we're infected with a love for the superhero, the, the miraculous people who fly and have feats of strength and all the other things, or our, our love of celebrity and sports heroes and all. The point is, is people easily make their lives revolve around such. And they give expression to an ultimate allegiance to and a devotion to that's that's borders on idolatry, if not outright idolatry. Calvin says even atheists turn to God under great stress and fear. Suddenly, that sense of divinity, which was repressed, bursts forth. Oh God, help us. But atheism is just uh, a subterfuge. It's, uh, it's an attempt to hide from God, like Adam and Eve in the garden after the fall. They have anxiety of conscience. And isn't it interesting they have conscience, a conscience, a sense of right and wrong, a cry for justice, a cry for equity? Well, Calvin would say that's the sense of divinity that's irrepressible. Now, it is repressed, though, to some degree. It's not extinguished, but it's corrupted. It's uh, certainly there's all kinds of people that mock religion, even in the psalm, among the psalmist. The psalmist says, uh, "The fool says in his heart, there is no God." Uh, atheism isn't a new kid on the block, but the worm of conscience cannot be escaped. Calvin uh, bids us. Uh, in, in light of the way uh, people would suppress the sense of divinity, we can only conclude that it's not a doctrine that must first be learned in school, 
but it's one that masters us in our mother's womb. Uh, knowledge of God in this sense then, this knowledge, awareness of God, not communing, fellowshipping knowledge of God, not I love you God knowledge of God, but this sense of the thatness of God and that he uh, ought to be worshipped uh, is a law of creation. And it, it simply gets corrupted and abused and misused. Now, Calvin goes on from there to talk about this knowledge of God as, well, it's either smothered or corrupted. And sometimes that's by ignorance, sometimes that's by outright malice. So this sense of divinity or this seed of religion, as he terms it, is... Um, not something people foster. Just because it's there doesn't mean it's nurtured and cultivated in a way that it bears wholesome fruit. Again, his point here is there's a knowledge of God out there that's given through the created order that's part of our very constitution as human beings, but we suppress or twist or corrupt uh, this knowledge so that it manifests in false religion, in false devotion, in um, outright uh, carnality, in rebellion against it, if you will, that people appealing to Romans 1 in particular, Calvin notes how people become futile in their thinking. There is a knowledge of God, the things out there declare it, and yet that's what renders us inexcusable for not acknowledging and making use of it appropriately. Rather, we use it inappropriately. And uh, th therefore, Calvin uh, would remind us that so long as we have a blind urge gripping us, uh, even gripping us to use our intellectual abilities to deny God, which the abilities come from God. The abilities testify to God. Uh, the marvels of what God grants to us call out to look to God, thank God. We use them instead to deny God. Uh, and when no fear restrains us from rushing against God in some violent way, or using our minds this way, um, this blind urge grips us, and our oafish, that's his phrase, oafish forgetfulness of God holds sway over us. Well, this manifests in all kinds of hypocrisy, whether it's the hypocrisy of, of the Christian religion twisted all out of shape, uh, people with their pomp and prominence uh, having priority or competing with Christ for devotion or various forms of false religion. All of this is suppressing that seed of religion, but it manifests as religious, as an ultimate allegiance, as giving yourself to, as serving it as a god or an idol. And... Um, in Calvin's day, of course, there was all sorts of perfunctory Christians, baptized but not really believers, sitting in church with dread, hating it to the point of loathing, um, all pretense, all just kind of going along, but there was no uh, reality within. So false religion is everywhere. It's rebellion and it's manifest because this seed of religion, the sense of divinity, has been corrupted and twisted and uh, basically suppressed and uh, broken, but sufficient never to be smothered. Well, Calvin kind of closes out his discussion of knowledge of God by turning to the created order itself, the fashioning of the universe and God's continuing governance of it. And here he says, look, everyone knows God because the created order itself testifies to God. Whether, even if you've never heard anything about Jesus or the Hebrew scriptures or the Christian Bible, uh, the testimony of the creator goes forth to all human beings, every tribe, tongue, people, nation, uh, 
and God's essence, though incomprehensible, his divinity far escaping our perception. Nonetheless, what's engraved upon the works of his hands so testifies to us that even unlettered and stupid people, he says, cannot plead the excuse of ignorance. So there's not a nook or cranny in the universe that doesn't declare it. The sciences, the liberal arts, even more so, the more you study the creation, the more proof is in the pudding, so to speak. The more so you should know God, and yet this knowledge is also rebellious, uh, rebelliously suppressed in uh, unrighteousness. So it's detestable how people in their madness take uh, God's testimony in the works of his hands and deny him, deny it. It's so important then that uh, we grasp that this knowledge of God also takes place in providence. Yes, there's unhappy providences, but there's happy providences. Yes, there's things that oppress and brutalize. There's also many blessings in these things. And the harsh things call us to ask God for help. The good things call us to uh, worship God in thanks and in every case arouse us to look to God for the future life and the blessings that follow. Uh, in no case should we sit idly and act as if uh, God hasn't made himself known to us. He altogether has. But superstition will choke it. We follow the common uh, herd in madness and denying God. And of course, in our day, we have rather superstar atheists who uh, champion uh, their atheism and follow through what Calvin's talking about here uh, in the use of podcasts and such things also. So it's very important that with knowledge of God, we see that God has given us a knowledge of himself. It's rooted in our very constitution with the seed of divinity. It's manifest in his work as creator and the providential Lord of the same. And so God does give us a true knowledge of himself, but a knowledge, sadly, forsaken, suppressed, and denied. Because this knowledge that Dr. Beach talked about is insufficient for salvation, he'll explain next time Calvin's focus on the nature and necessity of Scripture for knowing God and having faith. If you enjoyed today's episode, consider subscribing and sharing it with your friend or family member. Your support enables us to create more engaging content and it helps us foster not just a community of lifelong learners, but thoughtful practitioners. I'm Jared Luchibor. This has been an episode of MarsCast. We'll see you in the next episode.